I had a lot of time already to talk about it with friends and family and I think my best friends, they accept that the fact that there is a big possibility that I will end my life with euthanasia. And it was, it was very difficult for them, but they understood the reasons why I can't live anymore. 30-year-old Amy de Scooter spends most of her time at home. Her psychological suffering makes it hard to leave. But it wasn't always this way. At age 11, she went from being a happy, energetic child to feeling depressed and running away from home. At that time, there was no explanation. By 13, she had to be institutionalised in an adult psych ward, as the children's wards were full. So I saw a lot of things there that a kid just shouldn't see. I, don't, I can't count the amount of times that I was fixated or that I was in isolation. I didn't have any right to make up my own decisions. The traumas are a big part of my life, every day. Despite earning a degree in physics and starting a PhD, Amy was still suffering from her past traumas, nightmares and terrible mood swings. She tried to commit suicide more than 10 times. Her GP suggested euthanasia as a better way out. Uh, I really had to think about it. Was looking up a lot of stuff on the internet, and then at one, after one month, I was still not really convinced. So it took me a couple of weeks, extra, and then I went to my GP and said, "Yeah, I, I really want to, uh, to start my euthanasia request." Throughout the years, Amy had received many diagnoses. It was only when she was in the process of applying for euthanasia that a psychiatrist said she should be tested for autism. She is misunderstood, mistreated. So is that typical? That's what I say she is misunderstood. Eh? Because now it's very clear she has autism, but it's not seen all the time she was in hospital. So I think there were, there were better treatments for her than she got. They should have seen the diagnosis, and then my life would have been completely different because if they saw it when I was 12, 13 years old, then they could coach me from, from, from that age. In October, Amy published an autobiography that roughly translates to How to Turn a Flower into a Monster. She illustrated the front cover with her artwork. One of the reasons that I wanted to publish it is also because I'm not very good in explaining how I really feel and what goes through my head, but apparently I can write it down. <laughs> and I think a lot of people don't understand people who, are, who have a mental illness because it's too abstract for, the pe for them. They don't really comprehend it. Although the response to Amy's decision has generally been positive, a strong voice against euthanasia in Belgium is the Christian Church. God gave you the gift of life. God has allowed you to live for so many years. God may have a plan for you yet that you do not understand or you do not see. Maybe he would like you to say things or do things or help people or encourage people through your example. And so as a pastor, I would say, don't end it. Let God be the one who chooses when your life ends. It may be a life that's in pain. It may be a life that doesn't want to go on living, but the idea is to end it prematurely, perhaps, as from my perspective, it would be premature. Allowing mentally ill patients to be euthanized has been legal in Belgium since 2002. The main requirements for a patient to be approved are the patient's request must be in writing. The request is well considered and repeated. The patient has unbearable mental suffering. The illness is serious and incurable. Three doctors, including one psychiatrist, have signed the request. They have allowed at least one month between the patient's written request and the act of euthanasia. I can assure you that it isn't easy to get the approvals. It isn't easy at all. Um, at one time, during the euthanasia uh, procedure, I was so tired, so frustrating, that it took so, so many conversations with doctors, and I hate psychiatrists. 
and I had to go to them. So they, they again decided over my life, again. So that was very traumatizing for me. And at one time, I attempted suicide again. I, I, I tried, to, tried it again, even when I was in my procedure, because it takes so long. It's absolutely not easy. It's very difficult. And there's a lot of examinations that come before eventually euthanasia is performed. Knowing they are able to be euthanized is a relief for some mentally ill patients who would have otherwise committed suicide. You must know that people are afraid from suicide, almost all of them. They did already uh, attempts many times and it's painful, it's unsure, it's not humane. Um, so they are afraid from it. And at the same time, they are occupied by the wish to die. Yeah? So it's fighting all the time. In fact, uh, there's one of the Ten Commandments that says, Thou shalt not kill. And so that would apply to killing yourself too. Now, uh, you know, if somebody's in a terrible, terrible, horrifying mental state and is not really aware of what he or she is doing, you know, I'm not going to judge that person, but I would say to anybody that's contemplating self-suicide, don't do it. Because you, according to the Bible, are committing self-murder. And I would not want to be you and stand before God. When you are thinking about the, the best method to commit suicide, it's already awful because you're, most of the times you, you have to do it all by yourself. So it's very lonely. Um, and you do know that you will traumatize your friends and family. You, will, you always will. And also, it's, most of the times it's very painful. And I think most of the suicides happen by night obviously, so it's dark, you're lonely, you're scared. For Piero Vinke, the scenario became reality when his daughter Edith took her own life in 2011, days before her 35th birthday. Her family and doctors would not hear her wish to be euthanized. And it is really strange because uh, a police report is like a scenario of a film. After reading this report, I could rebuild the last five minutes of the life of my daughter in the details. It happened this here. She cut her trough with a, a, a razor. And uh, it was really bloody. As is, I was in an horror film that, was, that the ground was opening under my seat and that I would be swallowed. Since she was a teenager, Edith suffered from bulimia, anorexia, and other undiagnosed mental illnesses. Uh, my daughter spoke about euthanasia uh, a long time. And she explained to me uh, that uh, <coughs> my case fit in the euthanasia law. But the difficulty we, my, my daughter uh, was confronted with was to apply the law. She didn't find doctors who told her, okay, we'll start the process to have the signatures. Because when my daughter lived, my only wish is to keep her alive. And this was wrong. She begged for a dignified death. She armed herself with knives with fire. She took a, a fire to, for cigarettes and she burned her heels. It's difficult to measure a suffering. If somebody suffers with cancer, you see there is something growing like a gremlin in his body, it's swelling and of a psychological suffering, you see nothing. And if a, a, a young 
beautiful woman of 35 years tell you I'm suffering, it's difficult to, um, to believe because she seems so nice and so sunny. The only measure I know is that my daughter could burn her up to the bones and without suffering. However, opponents to euthanasia are often concerned that mentally ill patients are not capable of making the decision to end their own lives. Who's to say that that person is really in a 100% proper state of mind to be able to decide, I really want to die. I think this is the time. Maybe their mental faculties are not completely um, operating at 100%. So, you know, they may say, you know, I'd just rather be dead, but maybe there's still some valuable time left for this person. A mental disease doesn't necessarily take away your judgment. So saying that the judgment is not okay is a wrong statement. Therefore, we always take enough time to see, is this really a structural wish of the patient? And not an uh, acute moment. Well, I think it's a very bizarre argument because if I want to have kids, if I want to have an apartment, if I'm driving uh, with my car, then it's all okay. So then I am a part of the of human society and I can be part of it in every way I want. But when it comes to ending my life, then all of a sudden I, I'm, I'm not rational anymore. I can't think about it anymore. And that's a very strange, well, I don't understand the argument because it isn't an argument because I can do everything else. And then I'm not a problem, but when I, when I decide what I want to do with my life in that way, then it's a problem. And we as stupid parents, we believed that we could think in her place and that we could say her what was good or bad or best for her. So we always, instead of listening to what she was telling us, we were always convincing her to stay in this uh, structure. Thankfully for Amy, someone listened to her euthanasia request. After almost a year of waiting, her approval was granted this August. When I had a consultation with the psychiatrist and she handed me the piece of paper and then I cried for 10 minutes or so. I was like so happy, like, so and I received it and then I was like, okay, I don't have to commit suicide. And I felt an enormous relief. I don't believe in God, but I'm blessed with with my parents and my, my brother, they, they just stand behind me. Um, if, I, if I want to end my life with euthanasia or if I will try to keep fighting, they say it's your choice. We have to discuss directly with them about what they have in their minds. And that helps them. The, the fact to be listened at, the fact to be understood. If, if for you it's impossible to understand why my friend, the same age of me, wants to die and I want to live. Never try to understand. Listen. Although she is still suffering, life is improved for Amy, if only to a small degree. She is in no rush to be euthanized right now. She is working with an autism coach and has a psychiatrist she can trust. Well, um, a month ago I was really working on both parts. Like, if I want to live, what has to change? And I was also working on the euthanasia. But like these two parts, walking them at the same time is impossible. It's, I can't do that anymore. So now, the euthanasia is, in my head, it's on hold for 
sometime. I don't want to put a limit to it. But I want to see again how my life should change and how my quality of life should change. But I'm scared. I'm really scared because now I have to think about the future again. <laughs>